Welcome to Hordes Dairyman Livestream. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairyman. We're broadcasting from the Cheese Cave here, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson at the historic W.D. Horde & Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Horde. Let's start this episode with a shout out to those who've been doing good works out in the countryside. During the National Dairy Month in June, the American Dairy Association North joined the Milk Processor Education Program, that's Milk Pep, most of us will know, and Feeding America to support the Great American Milk Drive. They raised over $380,000 to get about 96,000 gallons of milk in the local families. And how successful was the 2020 effort? They doubled their donations from last year, and that is really exciting. And there's a lot of people suffering still through this pandemic. I do uh, look forward and we're gonna start our episode. Dairy is a powerhouse. Today's guests will help us navigate how retailers and other food service customers are getting back online. As a prelude to that discussion, let's start out with a poll question and our producer, Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois, will put that up on the screen. And the question reads like this. What is the biggest dairy cat category in grocery stores in similar retail outlets. Pick one here. You got to go with butter, yogurt, milk, or natural cheese. So we're going to wait for our people to, uh, our viewers to go through and answer that. We're getting some multiple answers here, uh, but the top one is trending very high. And we're at over 60% voted here. We know some people watch on their computers, and we know that others are taking this dairy live stream into a podcast and listening in the audio mode only mode. So we'll go ahead and cut off the poll here and get the answer on the screen. 41% did get the answer right. It's correct. Uh, is D natural cheese. In fact, the products leave that poll on the uh, screen there, Jim. In fact, the product answers are in reverse order. Natural cheese, milk, yogurt, and then butter. Dairy, a sales powerhouse. That line was for First, uh, was written by our first guest, Anne Marie Rohrink, in a recent newsletter produced by IRI, the International Dairy Deli Bakery Association, and her market research firm, 210 Analytics. And you'll see her moniker and her backdrop there. Anne Marie has a knack for distilling complex data into usable, easy to understand materials for business audiences, ranging from America's largest retail chains to single store family chains. In short, those are the folks selling our dairy products made from the milk on our farms. Anne-Marie, why are you stating that dairy is a sales powerhouse? Well, uh, Corey, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and share some, uh, some research stuff here. Uh, the reason why is, uh, well, let me back up here for a minute. My very last trip that I took prior to the pandemic was actually to the meat conference. And it was in Nashville. And maybe we all remember that they had a big tornado hitting there. And it was about a, maybe three, four miles from the hotel. We thought that was going to be the weirdest thing that was going to happen that year. Well, lo and behold, it was the last trip I took and our lives personally and professionally changed profoundly ever since. So I started off that particular speech with reading an article that I saw in Forbes and it just put my blood to boiling and it is one of many. And I wanted to start it off with here today as well. So the trends are ominous. Environmental activists have been pointing out the brontosaurus sized carbon footprints of eating small amounts of beef compared to the minuscule atm atmospheric impact of plant-based alternatives. Upstart companies like Impossible and Beyond have developed great tasting and wildly popular burger substitutes. And a think tank reports that dairy and cattle industries will be defunct by 2030 as scientists develop new meats and milk type products that are tastier, easier on the environment at a lower cost. Again, I don't know about you, but articles like that set my blood to boiling because there is very little truth in all of those. Bottom line is that it's still the norm for Americans to eat meat and to eat, pro to eat uh, drink, consume dairy. And whether we look at the number of households that buy meat and dairy, whether we look at the sales, it doesn't matter. It's so very clear that dairy and meat are still the norm in most households. 
And in that regard, I think coronavirus has actually done us a bit of a favor because it became very, very clear which items stores ran out of and which items sold like absolute gangbusters and which items were left on the shelf. And that's where the title dairy is a sales powerhouse come from. So if, if we can take a quick um, walk down memory lane here. So early March, life was normal. March 8th. Uh, that's when we saw things like beef and uh, uh, bleach and uh, hand sanitizer and all those types of things start to trend up. Then the weeks of March 15 and March 22nd, we had the largest, largest grocery weeks we have ever seen. And when we say grocery, we mean anything from like supermarkets to Walmart, everybody that sells food. Then the quarantine shelter in place started. People wanted to be in store as little as possible. So people took a lot fewer trips, but spend a lot while they were in there. Then the restaurants started to open back up and we see those sales come back down a little bit. So what happened to dairy during those weeks? Well, a normal week in dairy is about $1.3 billion. That's how much all those retail outlets sell. Well, during that crazy two weeks, March 15 and 22nd, we sold about $1.7 billion worth. So almost half a billion dollars worth just that one week. Um, then in, in terms of a percentage, when we compare the sales those weeks versus the same exact weeks the year before, we were up 60%. Um, that's incredible if you think about the amount of product that moved through retail stores. There were three dairy items actually that were more than double the size of the year before. That was butter, processed cheese, and margarine. That's incredible. So when we move further down the timeline and we just look at late June here, dairy sales are still 15% over normal, which is incredible. And what is the craziest thing is that we mentioned earlier, natural cheese is the biggest one of them all. Well, it's still growing at the highest rate. So we see basics like eggs and yogurt and milk and natural cheese all just trend above last year. I would say the only one that hasn't trended as high above last year uh, has been yogurt. And our theory on that is we see a lot of single serve yogurt move through the system when people are working out of home, going to school, et cetera. So that one is starting to come back as life is normalizing a little bit. So what is driving all of this? Well, overnight restaurants closed and all of a sudden every single meal occasion, whether it was breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, et cetera, moved to at home. So all of those dollars suddenly moved into the retail channels. Normally, the dollars are shifted about 50%, 50%. So all of a sudden, restaurant sales just completely collapsed. Then think about the number of mouths around the table as well. If you think about colleges being closed, kids being home from school, all of a sudden, you are feeding a lot more people at home as well. Um, just to give you a fun stat, after those crazy buy-in weeks, if you looked at what people bought on Amazon, there was a 6,000% increase in people buying knives, bowls, cutting boards, a couple of hundred percent increase in people getting coffee makers, pizza ovens, anything that you use to prepare, to prepare items. And more than anything, America was baking. We were going baking crazy. Yeast was sold out, flour was sold out, eggs were 100% over normal. Um, and that is still a huge opportunity for dairy. So if I have to think about what are the big opportunities for, for the dairy category, regardless of where you sit here in the supply chain, I would say people have re-engaged with dairy products across the board and let's make sure that they have a great experience and let's make sure that they feel good about their re-engagement with dairy. Think about the fact that people have cooked from home for four months now, and that's not something a lot of Americans did. So people are running out of ideas. Anything you can do to say, you know what, here is my favorite dairy product, here is what I do with it, get involved. People would love to hear with anybody that's actually in the supply chain. Third, immune system. Everybody right now is still worried about the virus. In fact, that concern is going up. If we can figure out how we can really highlight those nutritional trends, talk about the importance of dairy in the diet, I think that's a big opportunity. Last but not least, I think we need to think about um, mega trends have not gone away. People still want to hear transparency. For the farmers on the phone with us today, 
uh, this is a big role for you guys. People want to know the what, where, when, and how, how to get involved. And I think that is still an incredible opportunity for our dairy industry. Uh, environmental sustainability, social responsibility, all of those remain important and are big opportunities to uh, continue to be in the limelight today. So that is my quick update, Corey, over to you. Well, thank you. You know, and we uh, we normally don't take questions right away, but I think uh, in this discussion here on Dairy Livestream about dairy being a powerhouse, we're going to tackle this one right away. And Jim asks, what is natural cheese? And so when I came in the industry, I'm like natural cheese, processed cheese. Uh, Anne-Marie or Mike or Mark, you want to tackle that one so that everybody comes along on this journey with us? Maybe Mark, you want to you grab that quick? Well, sure, I'd be happy to, although I was going to say Mike in his many incarnations has spent some time, um, you know, in uh, the cheese industry, including a fair amount of process. But um, <clears throat> natural cheese is uh, cheese that has simply been uh, made and formed like we might normally think about, like cheddar cheese, good example of, of a natural cheese, mozzarella and others. Um, when we're talking processed cheese, we're talking about that kind of product being further refined and made into items oh, like uh, those uh, single serve um, square wraps that are put on top of a hamburger for a cheeseburger or perhaps the uh, semi-plastic cheese that gets pumped on a plate of nachos for, um, you know, the the, the cheese on, on uh, that kind of product. So that's the difference between those products. Thanks, Mark. I purposely didn't send that over to our next guest because we've got a fun poll question for him first. So uh, let's go to that poll question. Uh, Jim Baltz, our producer, will put that up. Our next guest is Michael Brown. What organizations has he, organization has he worked for? And you can select more than one of the following. So this is a, kind of a fun one here. And uh, so we'll go ahead and let those go in. And again, uh, you can see we took an audience question here early. We thought that was important to define natural cheese. My coworker here, Caitlin Allen, uh, will be sorting through those questions and, and helping me along here with the broadcast. So we're getting close here. We got about 60% voted. And we will uh, let, we'll close that off so we can keep going here on this one. So we'll put those answers up there. And I'm going to tell you that the correct answer is A, B, C, and D, and we could have even added National Milk Producers Federation, a trade lobby group, so we could have added an E category. Indeed, Michael Brown just may be one of the most unique individuals in our industry. He's seen the dairy sector from about every angle possible, including a cow's rump as a member of the Virginia Tech dairy cattle judging team in college. This economist then went to work for National All Jersey for 11 years, went to work for Dairy Gold, where he headed up member services for the Pacific Northwest Co-op, and also spent eight years with Glanbia. And now he is director of the dairy supply chain for the Kroger Company. Mike, 2020 has indeed been the wildest ride in your dairy career. What are you seeing? Well, we're seeing obviously a very wild ride. First couple months were pretty typical. We were seeing our usual uh, improvement in cheese and butter and declines in fluid milk and then the middle of March hit and oh boy did things change and uh, we really saw kind of so far three kind of cycles and keep in mind Kroger uh, obviously we have 2800 grocery stores we're in 35 states across the country uh, but we also uh, we also run 35 manufacturing plants including 17 fluid milk ice cream and uh, class 2 culture product uh, plants as well as two cheese cut and wraps where we process or package a lot of cheese. And we do make processed cheese, which by the way, the difference between process and natural is generally, and there's exceptions, is that processed cheese is used, uses natural cheese to be made. Uh, if you go back to the history of Kraft, that was the start of the Kraft company. And it was cheese that you didn't have to refrigerate back in the teens and 20s when that was a big, big concern. And we all know the beauty of it now is it melts wonderfully. And so uh, certainly the nacho uh, craze has helped. But um, back to Kroger, we've seen kind of three phases. Early uh, mid-March was crazy. Uh, Anne Marie is exactly right on what she said on uh, sales. They were nuts. Um, and we saw we struggled to get stores full. It was everything, not only product, but finding trucks to get it moved fast enough. Distribution was a real, real challenge. 
Um, but we, for the most part, we are relieved we did as well as we did. I mean, it got to be a point where if someone was in a Kroger locally here that happened to have bathroom tissue in stock, you might get a quick note saying, if you need some, you can get some here. Because it, it was that crazy and that tough. Uh, keep in mind, nobody keeps 40% of their plant open in case there's a pandemic. You can't afford to do that. You can't run just like a dairy barn. You can't run it half full. So as a result, uh, it was a lot of catch up to do. And we went through a lot of inventory very quickly. So that was the first phase. And that was really the first four or five weeks we really saw the last two of March, as Anne Marie said, were the biggest. And saw growth in everything from fluid milk, cheese, butter, you name it. Uh, there was incredible growth. Interest in baking, amazing. After that, keep in mind, we run, uh, we run uh, all those dairy plants. Of those dairy plants, um, of the 17 that do ice cream and fluid milk, there are two that buy cream and there's 17 that sell it. And it got to be kind of a joke working with cream. We sell cream um, through dairy.com like a lot of people do, which is a, a firm that offers a lot of services, including brokerage of cream. And we, we became part of the Dump Cream Club, which means that we had loads we simply couldn't find a home for because there was no place that could take it. Well, what caused that? Well, we had that big rush in early March where the grocery stores are buying everything in sight. But by start of April, particularly by mid-April, food service had slowed down, of course, drastically. And so we were dealing with problems with particularly class two, a lot of cream cheese in, in food service, a lot of creams in food service, sour creams, those kinds of products. There wasn't a demand. A lot of them are a little bit shorter shelf life, so they just weren't rebuilding capacity. So we reached a point where, you know, butter was, again, a full disclosure, a lot of you probably know this. I'm a Jersey cow guy. I've owned several breeds. I always say I have a practice of affirmative action as a kid. We had Ayrshire's, Holsteins, and Jerseys, but I'm a, a Jersey guy at heart. And uh, it, was, it was tough to see. But then we went into phase three. Uh, places started to open back up. That food chain, uh, that uh, food service chain, had pretty much depleted, particularly fresh product supply. Uh, we had actually bought a fair amount of product in bulk packs, five pound packs of cheese, for example, to make sure we had enough product because we had a shortage of consumer packaging capacity. I think that's one thing that a lot of people uh, may not be aware of. The issue wasn't finding butter or cheese, it was finding a place to put it in a consumer package. Uh, we were we were working with every partner we have that helps with our supply to make sure we have product for our customers. And we did uh, move into some, uh, again, those larger food service packs just to make sure if someone wanted cheese that they would have it. So we did that. But then in, in phase uh, two, uh, at the same time, cream starts to drop. All of a sudden, food service comes back and we come into phase three where we've gone from the record lowest milk price or cheese price in April ever on, on CME or, or NAS average, and certainly in the last 10 years, uh, to the highest uh, in June. We were the highest ever, and I just did a sort on that, and I think the next seven months are all either 2019 or 2014. They're all kind of right there. So we went to very, very high prices. Uh, what caused that? Refill the food chain. There's a lot of export activity uh, for cheese being made in June and May and partly into July that were commitments that were made that tightened up some of that supply. Milk supply, of course, started to drop some places. So we went uh, from having plenty of cheese and no place to process it to where sales have started to slow down. They've still been very, very strong to where we're now dealing with, um, frankly, you couldn't get some varieties for a while. That's starting to change again. So the blessing of all this is what was a horrible spring the paychecks for dairy, particularly if they're in a cheese market, are going to look a whole lot better, and they need to. I mean, we have to have – my dad always said, uh, anytime you do a business deal, he had a farm supply service, and we bought and sold some cows. If both sides aren't doing well, then the business doesn't last. you got to have that supply chain health. So we're actually delighted to see that. But now we're at a point now where uh, supplies have uh, become available. We aren't dealing with the shortages, for example, with butter that we were dealing with, which has been incredible growth in butter this year. Uh, and looking forward now, we expect that to stay a bit heightened. Fluid milk has come way down. I think part of that also is that we're now comparing out of school this year to out of school last year before we were comparing in school. And that's about 10% of demand when school's in progress. So we're seeing that starting to slow, but still healthy. So um, we're uh, continuing to work to make sure we have enough product and feeling a little more comfortable now uh, in April with the prices where they were, we were really concerned. 
this doesn't turn around what supply would do. It's looking uh, much, much better. May not be great, but it's certainly looking better. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, we're gonna turn to Mark Stevenson now and welcome back to Dairy Livestream. Uh, Mark, consumers are demanding dairy. Can you help us tie together Anne-Marie and Mike's observations for those of us on the farm and those of us working with farmers? Well, I'd be glad to try, Corey. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of things that I've been gleaning from the headlines over the last few weeks that I think are interesting and they relate to retail and they relate to consumers. And, you know, I'm going to pose or just toss out several of these things. And during the discussion time period here, I'm hoping that Mike and Anne Marie can uh, maybe react to a few of these. But uh, one of the headlines uh, that I had seen, actually, there's been more than one of those, um, has talked about the declining number of SKUs. That's a term that's used to mean stock keeping units. So, you know, if you think about just the dairy case, for example, um, a gallon of uh, whole milk is a stock keeping unit, of Kroger whole milk is a stock keeping unit. A half gallon is a different stock keeping unit. Pints are a different stock keeping unit, and so are other things. But um, large retail chains that have had tens of thousands of SKUs in the store have depleted pretty significantly. They've trimmed down their lines. Now, some of that has been due to the channels not being able to keep them supplied. Some of it's been due to efficiencies they've tried to get there by just saying, look, let's get the large volume products in here and try to make sure that we can keep up with those. And perhaps some of those have been uh, just thinking or uh, re-rationalizing, um, what are we making money on and what are we actually losing money on? So I'd be interested in some feedback there. According to a Nielsen thing, dairy itself across the board was down about 6.6% .6 in SKUs. So we simply don't have as many in the dairy case now uh, as we had before. And there may be some consumers that are actually happy with that or, or at least okay with that. There's evidence that there's, you get too many uh, things to choose from and it becomes a tyranny of choice. It's hard to decide what do I want. So maybe having something a little bit more rationalized is better. Um, we've also seen some headlines where people are asking for more shelf life in products. Now that's increased quite a bit um, over my lifetime, I remember when beverage milk uh, used to be 12 or 14 days code date on a package. And, you know, today, if it isn't 21 days or more, I'm surprised. So um, I'm actually wondering what do we need additional shelf life for? This talks a bit about inventory and who's going to hold it. I don't think that plants want to hold any more in the cooler. Um, I'm not aware that uh, grocery stores have a much capacity to hold a lot more. Do we really want to hold that much more in our home refrigerators? Um, I'm not convinced of that, but uh, nevertheless, consumers have been asking for some of that. Um, we've had this idea about back to basics as well. Uh, things like bread baking or game night and, uh, you know, dairy has certainly fallen into a lot of that. And I think part of the back to basics have been things like uh, headlines that indicated fluid consumption or use is up, and cold cereal as well. Uh, Phil Plord has said those two are best buddies. Um, I understand that maybe cold cereal sales have dwindled a bit too, and maybe we're getting a little tired of playing Yahtzee with uh, everybody in the household. Um, so I wonder to what extent we as consumers are getting not only tired of our confinement, but back to basics has worn off. Um, <laughs> Uh, don't tell my mother-in-law, but I'm going to reveal a little secret. She went on a spur for a period of time when she was trying to perfect chicken paprikash as a recipe. And she made that silly recipe, I don't know how many times. And finally, the family was just saying, I, I, we're tired of this. We're done with it. That wasn't during this uh, epidemic or pandemic. Uh, but I think it's representative of what cons some consumers are doing now, too our recipe repertoire isn't big enough and we're becoming bored with the things we're doing. And this is part of the reason maybe that, um, you know, we're tired of preparing food at home. We want more variety. So what can dairy do, you know, to help meet the customer where they are and maybe give them some ideas about how to expand. 
You know, and the one last thing I'm going to throw out here that I think uh, might be an interesting point of discussion, we're very focused on the kind of demand that we have for milk and dairy products right now, today, this week. Um, I think the other day, uh, Mike made a comment to the extent that, um, you know, long-term thinking about uh, demand for products is like four weeks at this point in time. We, we aren't really thinking out there four months or more. Uh, and most of our demand models, you know, where people are trying to understand what kind of pre-buying we should be doing are just out the window. So I think everybody's a little bit nervous about things. And I really wonder about our Thanksgiving through Super Bowl, the big uh, period of sales, you know, for dairy products of all sorts. When we consume a lot more at home because family are there and we're making meals and doing a number of other things. Was there anything we can learn at all about Fourth of July sales? Um, we were home, pandemic was still active. I know it's not necessarily a big dairy time period, but we've probably had little celebration meals that we were preparing. Did that tell us anything about what we could expect perhaps for this fall? Despite the sagacity of tweets that we have from time to time, I don't think the, the uh, pandemic's done, and I don't think it will be done by the time we get to the fall or the end of the year. Uh, so I wonder if there's something we can anticipate in terms of sale through our big sales period of the year. And with that, maybe I just throw it back out uh, to our group, Corey. I saw Anne Marie nodding, and uh, she may want to comment on that. And before she does, I want to remind our audience that there's a question panel, and you could submit questions that we can ask our audience members. My coworker Caitlin here will go through those. But Anne Marie, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, absolutely. You bring up a great point on what we call everyday demand, which is just the demand that is driven because people are cooking at home more. And then there's the holiday demand. So if you think about when the pandemic started, we had Easter, Mother's Day, uh, Memorial Day, and Fourth of July all since the start of the pandemic. And I will tell you, every single one of them has been a powerhouse. So what is happening is that people want to celebrate. They want to celebrate birthdays and graduations and, and all our national holidays. However, they're not doing it in the same way that they have been doing it. So typically we see a lot of travel for Memorial Day, for July 4th, big groups getting together. That is not happening, but it's actually the backyard barbecue with the small immediate family that is helping grocery a lot. So where normal weeks are sitting about 10, 15% above that same week last year, the holiday weeks have been incredible. And the 4th of July, every single one of them, Father's Day, Mother's Day, they've all been huge. So my concern right now is we've got a long stretch all the way to, to Labor Day. Um, what is going to happen with uh, football tailgating parties, et cetera. Again, this might actually help the retail channels because instead of being out tailgating or, or being out in, in a bar watching the game, people are now going to be at home. And I think as an industry, as retailers, wholesalers, everybody up to the farm, uh, these are great opportunities uh, to, to make sure that people continue to celebrate but it also has some practical applications that might definitely add to this. But what I'm seeing, for instance, on the bakery side is that we're not selling those half sheet uh, cakes. We're not selling the 24 cup cakes because people don't need 24 cup cakes. That's what we used when the kids were at school to celebrate their birthdays. Um, so we need to make sure that we recognize that everyday life and holiday life has changed. And as a result, what people buy has changed as well. Mike? Yeah, um, Anne-Marie, uh, you could be a Kroger spokesperson because we're experiencing exactly what you're saying. So uh, uh, it's nice to know that we're in the, we're in the mix. A couple of things that Mark commented on. One is shelf life, Mark. We've seen that for a while. And I think part of it, for example, when you all of a sudden, oh my God, it's, it's the end of March and who knows what's gonna happen, I'm gonna buy four gallons of milk. Well, if it all has 21 day shelf life and you don't use it quick enough, all of a sudden you're realizing you can have a, an issue. Uh, we've seen for a long time that there's uh, pent up, I would argue, demand for extended shelf life and aseptic packaging for milks. Um, if you try to find capacity for products put in those kind of packages, it's very, very difficult. We run, we, we run one line of each. 
a septic in Denver and in a in an ESL line in in Kansas City, and they I'm out. Not sure, what those are because I, I I'm those two lines. Tell people a little about aseptic and the other one. Okay, aseptic means it doesn't need to be refrigerated, although most of it is because con con consumers struggle with not having them out refrigerated. And there's two different kinds. Uh, probably the most, uh, the first, and actually there's a, a plant in Utah that does a lot of this, is what you call a brick pack. It's that, um, uh, it's basically multi-layered foil and paper packaging and plastic. And you poke a little hole in the corner and, or you can cut it and open it up to pour. It's, it's the most shelf stable. It's not quite as convenient. Our plant is actually a plastic bottle, a septic plant where you, uh, it looks like a milk jug kind of. We sell them if you are around where there's either a picket fries or um, pick and save or pick your store that Kroger's involved with. We sell all of our creams that way and our quarts and pints all are sold that way uh, and they come out of that plant. Um, and then the plant in uh, is the, the ESL is those half gallons you buy that have the 60 day shelf life that you see. And it'll say, it'll say ESL on an extended shelf life or it'll say ultra pasteurized. And those products are a lot of the things that are a little higher value, that don't move quite as fast. And the, the other advantage of those products is uh, supply chain. If you have a flex in demand, they're a little actually a little better than, for example, like cottage cheese or, um, or sour cream. They have enough shelf life. You can flex a little bit as demand moves. Fresh milk, you sell it or you don't sell it. You really don't have a lot of, a lot of option. And with Kroger, we try very hard to not have milk on the shelf that doesn't have at least 10 day shelf life. We want people to make sure people take it home and they can abuse it a little bit and enjoy it. And it will be good because one thing we do know is that fluid milk drives a lot of sales outside of fluid milk in a supermarket. A lot of the biggest uh, grocery buyers buy gallons, as you might imagine. And so the last thing we want to have them do is not like our milk. And so they start buying the milk someplace else and the laundry detergent and the vegetables and everything else. So we see that. So those those two types of milk are are growing because of that convenience. One thing consumers don't always understand is once you open them, particularly if you don't keep them cold, they don't have any more shelf life than conventional milk does. It's 10 days, more or less, once you open those, those containers up. But the growth is there. We will see, I think, more growth in capacity in those lines as we go ahead for the reason that Mark uh, said, convenience and people will pay for shelf life even if they don't need it it's what our research has found yeah because we do offer fresh versions um so what we saw it from surveys was that people wanted two to three weeks worth of food in their freezers fridges and refrigerators and uh, pantries so the easiest example i can give you is actually produce normally fresh fruits and vegetables make up about 85 percent of all fruit of all fruit and veggies sold in the store during those crazy two weeks fresh was down to 70 percent of sales and frozen and canned made up all that other dollars so people were looking for a way to say if i don't get back to the store and i'm truly sheltered in place i need that there and i think that's where part of the shelf life discussion and dairy came from as well like how do i get two to three weeks worth of dairy in my refrigerator uh, what can I freeze? What can I not? Can I have some pantry shelf stable items? Um, so yeah, that that's right in line with everything we're seeing. You know, this pandemic has changed things uh, not only on, on the dairy and the meat side, but another thing. In Anne Marie, you have a wealth of knowledge there, but you saw a group of people, consumers, go out and learn to bake again, and we're buying some unique things that I would have thought would have been in everybody's house, but they're not. Can you talk about a little bit about the baking side, the tools and equipment? Yeah, so if you think about the baking aisle, right, where you buy your flour or your mixes or whatever, that was one of the very first aisles that just emptied out and it had it continued to be emptied out so a lot of reporters ask me like have we ever seen anything like this before my answer is no we've dealt with blizzards we've dealt with hurricanes but typically that's only three four hundred skus as mark explained earlier uh, it's very regional it's very limited number of time days uh, and all of a sudden now we're dealing with this for weeks and months on end so what happened in baking is very early on 
people are like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be stuck in the house. What am I going to do? How am I going to entertain the kids? So baking became what we call the cocooning behavior, right? It gave people something to do. It helped with their anxiety. Kids loved it. Uh, we saw things like pizza ovens, bread uh, makers, and it was hilarious because a lot of my, my friends started sending me pictures of all their homemade friends. Yeast was sold out, flour was sold out, and of course all the dairy items that go hand in hand with that, the butter, the milk, uh, the eggs, um, all were up up to between 70, 80, 90 percent above the same week last year. We're still seeing baking be extremely prevalent. Uh, a lot of people ask me, do we think that all is going to stick? I want to say, you know, once evening activities start back up, once we have to commute into the office again, you know, that same pressure on time that a lot of consumers had at what drove them out to dinner in the, in the first place, some of that will continue to come back. But more than anything, whether you sit on the meat side, the dairy side, it doesn't matter to me. We've had four months where people were forced to cook and bake and learn new skills. So we have a lot of consumers who did things and cooked things and baked things um, and bought items that they had not bought in years. And I think that's going to be a huge opportunity for our industry going forward. Yeah, I, I'd agree with all that. And we expect that we'll be continue to be, I think it's pretty safe to say there's gonna be a continued lift. The degree of that lift is the thing we're all trying to figure out back to that uh, forecasting out more than four weeks. One thing we saw specifically interesting uh, in dairy, we already mentioned, was change in pack size, but also another change. But snack cheese sales actually have gone down and they were growing like gangbusters. That's like the little packs with nuts and raisins or whatever they may be. Uh, bulk bigger sizes have gone up. Two pound bags of cheese versus eight ounces has gone up. Uh, butter, we have seen three times the growth in unsalted as in salted, which again goes back to that whole baking. Uh, thing we're actually changing our order strategy. Thankfully, the plants make one make the other. So we're changing our order strategy on uh, on butter uh, and letting them know that because that shift is for real. Uh, they're kind of happy with that because a lot of their food service business was unsalted. And so we were picking up some of that and selling it in the retail. But it's, it's, it is for sure it's for real. I can't speak for everyone. I'm still a little reluctant to eat in a restaurant. I haven't yet. I finally hadn't had a good egg roll in so long. In May, I finally went out and got carry out, but that's about <laughs> all I've done is a little bit of that, but it, it has really impacted that, uh, that consumer and generally quality dairy always benefits when people eat at home. We sell over half our dairy fat in food service. We sell 45% of cheese or so in food service, but we have uh, been able to pick up a lot of that uh, business because people love those products. So they're figuring out how to put it into their daily menus, which is of course, great for our industry. We have a question that came in and I'm gonna take care of this one uh, about dairy revenue protection. And I would say this to our viewer that asked that, we archive all our dairy live streams. So this one will be archived tomorrow, but our June 24th episode had, was, uh, is the milk price rebound for real? And that was what Mark, Chris Wolf and Andy Novakovic, and they dug into that one. And I'd go back and, and watch that. Uh, what uh, dairy live stream. Mike, I'm gonna ask you to, you said planning maybe four weeks out and that might even be long at best, but how are you strategizing for product purchases for the rest of your, perhaps pick a product like butter and walk us through that category. Butter sales are kind of 20% and 20% in these different quarters and then boom, the fourth quarter comes and we have no idea what the fourth quarter is gonna look like. How are you, what are you what's your thought process? Uh, I'll, I'll go back to some of Anne Marie's comments. Is is the lift in absolute or is the lift in percentage? We sell twice as much butter in the last three months than we do in any other quarter of the year. It's kind of 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% 40%. So it's a huge deal. Because of that, your butter makers have what we call build plans and they actually make butter, freeze it ahead, and then they, they temper it, which is the fancy word for thawing it. Today, most of that's in retail package. It may be done with, with what they call micro fixing, where they take bulk butter, basically shred it up, three melt it, then package it. And it's perfectly fine. It has the same shelf life. We don't see a difference in customer comments. They like it. Uh, but uh, the problem has been is that there, there's plenty of bulk butter and there is butter being froze and there'll be micro fixing earlier this year because of that. But the, the limitation is basically uh, packing capacity. 
what can we get to put in four quarters in a single in a customer box to, the way that they want to buy butter you can sell five pound bags of cheese it's a little hard to sell a 25 kilogram box of butter in the grocery store although someone would probably buy it if we did uh, but what we've so what we have done is we've actually went out and bought extra capacity and it's not at the same cost as our current as you might imagine just because it's spot market uh, so that we can be more assured products like butter where you have a six month shelf life we put six months sell by date from the date of manufacture or if it's thawed from the date of thaw and so we have some time to move to that because of some flex in in timing same with cheeses so we are actually because the worst thing you can be in a grocery store i always say the three cuss words are kroger are out of stock that's the worst thing you can be so we are actually investing a little more in inventory on some of these products to make sure we meet customer needs the other thing we have found is that internally and it's probably because of our i want to brag on this too much but we have our own bakeries we make our own dog food uh spaghetti sauce uh, salad dressing you name it a lot of that's actually made by kroger so we have had less issues with uh, supply than some of our national brand vendors have. So our share of sales that go to Kroger brands has actually increased significantly actually in the last few months. And so our goal now is of course to hold on to that and keep that, keep that growth in, inside. It's been a chance I think for a lot of consumers because they couldn't get exactly what they're used to to try a different product. And uh, in some cases we're seeing a benefit from that. But I think the big thing is that you buy a little more than you think you need, but make sure you don't buy so much you can't get it sold before it's no longer desirable to buy a consumer. So it's more of a balancing act. Mark, uh, you know, one of the things here to bring this big picture here, we're talking about retail, and then we have a lot of dairy farmers on here and those that work uh, with dairy farmers. But we've seen the swings. We've seen the high and low of milk prices. And when milk prices drop dramatically, we don't always see that in the store. And why? is the question and this COVID-19 thing has really made the situation so darn complex here let's talk through that and Mark why don't you leave that one out well I'd be happy to I mean we've made studies of this for a long period of time um, we've had a lot of volatility in milk prices at the farm level we we've seen that at wholesale um, we see prices you know being really quite volatile as well but you know, by the time they get up to the consumer, I think that, you correct me if I'm wrong, but retailers realize that consumers don't like a lot of volatility in prices. Maybe once in a while they like to see a special going on, but they don't like to see prices bounding up and down every week or every month. And so they do try to buffer those prices out so that uh, you know their margins are much tighter, possibly even uh, lost leaders in some cases on products at some period in time and other periods of time when prices are relatively low for farmers make up some margin, but they get buffered and smoothed out. But it does get me down to a question that I would like to pose. Um, we've had relatively low farm gate prices out here and yet at the store, in fact, I, I had an angry dairy farmer <laughs> that snapped a picture and sent it to me, you know, where the store was indicating that prices are going to be going up on dairy products a little bit. So, you know, be prepared for that. And I think that one of the things we don't think about is just the added costs that we've had as a result of this pandemic through the marketing chain. You know, it's not just at one point in, in the chain, it's been all the way up through it. And, you know, maybe Mike and Anne Marie can talk a little bit about uh, what stores have had to do to deal with um, you know, these kind of issues and why there may be some increased costs. I'll let Anne Marie go first so I can be lazy and just agree with her. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try my best, all right? Um, so, you know, all of us are shoppers, so without a doubt, you've seen the plexiglass uh, shields that are put up at the cashier level. Um, there's many investments in the store where there's a lot more hand sanitizer stations, there's masks given out to the staff. So there's all the cost of the physical um, additional hygiene and protection equipment. The other thing that is happening is that uh, a lot of retailers and really uh, companies throughout the supply chain realized that people who are working on keeping the supply going are really risking their own lives to, to feed America. And very early on, we saw a big shift in a lot of companies from saying customer first to 
you know what, during times like these, it's employee first. And so many retailers, as well as uh, suppliers all throughout the chain, started paying people more. And that was typically an initial $2, what they call hazard pay, much like the military. And in addition, if people called in sick, they got two weeks worth of paid sick time. Um, so in terms of the labor and in terms of having to hire a whole lot more labor in order to make these jumps possible, uh, there just was a lot of extra labor and benefits cost in the system in addition to those protective measures that were being taken. And all of those costs, of course, are spread out across uh, every single uh, price across all the different departments. Then we've had uh, departments like the meat uh, situation where tightness just drove up prices. So that's another report I write each week and I'm happy to share uh, with any of the listeners here on the call today. Uh, but right now we're looking at about uh, 15 to 18% inflation in the meat department with led by beef at, at about 30% over normal right now. So yes, shoppers are seeing higher prices, not just in dairy, but really everywhere. Across the store, it's about 6%. Um, and then there's departments like meat that are very extreme. Dairy is actually, um, fairly modest compared to some of the others. Yeah, I, I'd agree with all that. And for example, we look at our plants and of course we, there's a corporate team that works with those plants. We have corporate engineers, we have corporate uh, basically problem solvers, call it continuous improvement, which we all can benefit from. Well, they're not traveling right now. So you think, wow, that's a huge savings. We're spending more on sanitizer than that travel budget in additional sanitation and plants. Uh, if you have, and we be dishonest to say we haven't had COVID cases in our plants. We so far have really been blessed. We haven't had spread issues like some other food industries have had within a plant. But when you have a, someone who's positive, first of all, if they, if they suspect they are, they're out for 14 days and they can come back once they're, uh, they're get, they get a clear test and they're paid uh, to, to Amory's point. The second thing, we did the hazard pay as well and continue to do some of that. The third thing is, um, is that uh, don't think just because the price of the butter went to $1.15 and cheese went to a dollar, we bought product for that. Because we did some on contracts, but any of this additional spot need, when you're bidding for manufacturing capacity, and they're all dealing with the same costs, the same labor issues, uh, those costs have gone up. And so you, you pay for that. So the other, and the third part of that is, is well, why wasn't milk cheaper in, uh, in uh, April than it was, or particularly May or June than it was in January, February? Well, I'll respond to that is, is why isn't the cost going to go up in July and August? Because it's not. We keep those prices. How we manage margin is mostly through promotions. So if cheese gets really reasonable, we'll run more sales. The everyday low price doesn't necessarily change a whole lot. If we, uh, if uh, so, if cheese were to drop back down, God forbid, into the 130s, we'd run more promotions. When is it 270? We're going to run less, which means that we'll probably sell a little less. But uh, our goal is to keep margin more stable. I would be dishonest to say we didn't have great margins in particularly April and May, but I can assure you they're going away. We're now selling some of that $2.50 cheese from June in our stores in July. We're not raising retails. And we may run less sales. So we try to smooth that because uh, the only thing harder to explain milk pricing than to someone in the industry is someone who's not. And to explain to a consumer, this is why we try to not do that. I did want to comment on one other thing unrelated, and that is on, on uh, animal care and all of those issues. I think many of you may know Kroger's been a very, very long supporter of the farm program. We think they've done a great job. It's been an industry uh, partnership everywhere uh, from the consumer down to dairymen. Uh, and uh, it's not necessarily a fun thing to have to do. I think what my the, the air would have been been blue if you'd had a farm out there on my dad's farm in the early 70s, and I think we did a pretty good job, but no one's going to come in and tell me what to do. Uh, I thank the industry for that because it, it gives us a story that, frankly, a lot of the rest of the livestock industry doesn't have a stronger story to tell. So um, we appreciate that. We think that's one of the reasons dairy continues to do well. But to anne point, that same Forbes article you saw, that made me so mad. Um, we do have to work to get people to understand that, yeah, milk was long for about four weeks, and then it wasn't long anymore. A, we had some supply retraction, some co-ops managed that. And in the end, it's a good return. Milk prices, as Mark will tell you, are inelastic. 
So uh, if we can lose a little milk, you'll see a bigger bump in price. And generally that means uh, uh, farmers will do better. So, uh, you know, the industry will self-correct over time. We've come off a few rough years. So we had a good fall last year and I think this is what blew everybody so off course. And it looks like we're back to something a little more reasoned. Hopefully it'll hang on. We're gonna move to a couple rapid fires here. We got about 10 minutes left in the program. Our first rapid fire is gonna to go to Anne Marie. So in the next 45 seconds, can you tell us a little bit uh, on this matter? One of the biggest obstacles in the meat case counter was consumer confidence in buying a cut of meat and properly preparing it for dinner. How has the pandemic began to change that? And the reason I asked that, Anne Marie, uh, all our viewers should know that about 20 to 25% in any given year of the beef sold in the United States comes from dairy cows or steers or something of that nature. Anne Marie? Absolutely. So the Forbes article talked about the beef industry in particular going to oblivion, and, and the opposite is true. So absolutely, a lot of the younger consumers struggle with uh, what I call their culinary comfort zone. So they know how to flip a burger, they know how to maybe make chicken breasts, and that's about where their meat knowledge ends. So they're very intimidated by things like seafood and higher end beef cuts. They were forced to buy them now because there were times where you get into the store, the only thing that was available was rec -a lamb or, or beef ribs, and people start to experiment. A, because they had to, there was nothing else to be bought, and B, because they were trying to make new recipes to bring some variety. So we've seen things like bison and lamb and all sorts of beef cuts that never really moved beyond the boomer consumer end up in people's baskets now. That can only be good for us going forward. People are now more knowledgeable, more confident in the kitchen, and that just means that uh, they're going to buy that going forward. Mike, and uh, I'm sure Kroger has discussions about this. This question comes from uh, a person in Wisconsin. How has, the re how has retail adjusted to online sales versus in-store shopping? Do you anticipate this to be a long-term change? We anticipated it to be long before the pandemic, and thank goodness we were pretty well prepared for it. Um, and where we really see, there's really two parts of online sales. There's delivery and then there's pickup at store. And uh, where we've seen huge growth in both, uh, way ahead of our projections. In fact, it's, uh, it's up over 100% in the last few months. Uh, what, does that, what does that mean long-term? Uh, consumers, once they've tried it, tend to stick with it. We've had pretty good um, uh, repeaters in our, in our uh, purchases. A lot of customers were using it on those chronic out-of-stock items like bathroom tissue or sanitizer and they said well once we get our order in once kroger gets it they're going to it'll end up in their box i mean it, 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 at some point so they kind of use it as a way to assure a supply what we did see is the time i mean it used to be day of pickup if you ordered in the morning you could probably pick it up in the afternoon it may it may have gotten spread out several days kroger hired about 10 percent more people than we already had employed during the pandemic for everything from more people in shifts work in the factories. A lot of it was that customer service, restocking, but a lot of it was for uh, for orders. In fact, long-term, we were investing in this system. Uh, it's a joint venture with a British company called Ocado. And it basically is a warehouse that packs orders. And it's all these little cells in the ground, uh, refrigerated or, or ambient temperature. And it, you do an order and it goes around and picks up however many units it needs from each of those boxes and brings it over to a packing station. Uh, we see that as a lot of growth. Our first one will open in Florida, which is interesting because we don't have stores in Florida, but I think the premise is we have so many retirees from north of there that all have Kroger's that hopefully they'll like being able to buy Kroger locally. But we see that as nothing but growing. And the thing that we always talk about technology and how, uh, uh, older folks, I'm 60, I'm not exactly a spring chicken, but are intimidated by it. And I have to admit, I like to go in the grocery store, but that's partly because I want to see what my stuff I'm buying looks like. Do we have enough of it and all that? Uh, is older folks have really appreciated the not having to have human contact, having to have the pickup. And so we've had huge growth uh, with a lot of our older customers, which you normally would think this is a millennial thing. It's not, it's everyone, which has been oh. an education for us. Our next quick question here uh, is to Anne Marie. How have dairy product sales compared to dairy alternatives during the pandemic? 
Well, so uh, the good old consumer media loves to tout the enormous uh, jump in percentages for, for plant-based meat alternatives and dairy. And of course, as I always say, if you look at the sales of dairy versus alternatives, it's a pinch brick and a giant uh, pie. And it's very easy to have high growth percentages on the pinprick, but it's still a pinprick. So I actually looked at the share at the very onset of the pandemic on March 1st versus the share for the latest week that I had available. And the share of plant-based uh, dairy is actually down. So even though they have sold big percentages worth, in the end of the day, it's dollars we, we take to the bank. And from a share perspective, uh, dairy is doing better. We have a, a listener from California say that she's still seeing limits on purchases for butter and shortages of their other dairy products out on the West Coast. Are you seeing that anywhere else in the country? It depends on the supplier. Uh, in our case, we have had shortage issues in some markets and not in others, and it really depends on the supplier. We've had a few suppliers that have been impacted more strongly by COVID itself, as far as labor force in a plant which hasn't allowed them to run at full capacity. That's true in pretty much any dairy product you want to think about, but certainly true in butter and also some green ice cream. So yes, that is, that is true. But the issue isn't lack of product, it's lack of processing capacity again uh, for those products that's been this stream. We have two, two co-ops that are expanding their butter processing capacity. Uh, this one started this spring, that's Continental down in Texas. And the other one is uh, CDI out in California. And so they're building, and those are planned, of course, long before the pandemic, but they're already sold out. So that's the kind of uh, craziness it's been. So uh, it's, again, it's that packaged product that's the problem. It isn't the commodity itself. Mark, a quick question for you. Uh, we had uh, a couple readers chime in here and say, how do we get consumers to understand which dairy products they can uh, store long-term? And we're talking about like which ones can be frozen and those kind of things. You want to add a little uh, which products I know cheese can I don't know what other ones butter obviously could well certainly cheese and butter can be stored a long time and a lot of our other products um, you know have really quite long code date even at refrigeration colder is better than uh, you know uh, more moderate temperatures but wow you know again think back to uh, products like cottage cheese um, that is now sealed in uh, uh, gas proof cartridges and it uh, it lasts a very long time so too do our other products that are relatively soft like sour creams and other things um, and i think it's important for virtually all food products to recognize that the code date that's on there is more like a best buy than it is actually a you know don't dare touch it or throw it out um, you know you should be checking your products the uh, dates on much of our dairy products that we've had that we don't go through in great volumes or a few items like that last a very long time fresh, in particular the creams and things. Uh, they'll be well past their code dates and still um, not uh, in any kind of uh, problem or issue. Well, here's the, oh, we're gonna go to the final question here just because we're uh, running short on time here. We talk a lot about increase in sales during the pandemic. How do we keep this momentum going? How can dairy better align our products for consumer preferences moving forward? Let's start with Anne-Marie. A lot of consumption occasions that are at home. A lot of people expect to continue to work from home. So let's make sure that uh, we, we do get those single serve yogurts back in their refrigerator, even though they're not traveling and really address every single uh, consumption occasion. I talk a lot about snacking. Um, that is a big opportunity where traditional snacks like cookies and salty snacks, et cetera, could re be replaced by a nutritious dairy snack. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. A lot of people have re-engaged with dairy. Uh, they want to hear from the entire supply chain, so get involved. And I think we have a huge opportunity to continue to sit well above last year's base levels. Mike? Same, uh, again, uh, a good agreement. One thing we still see with consumer trends is less sugar in their diet and they're not afraid of fat. A healthy fat like dairy doesn't scare them like we did to people for years and years and years, kind of the same thing with eggs. So we see that continuing. I think continuing to work on code, freshness, also um, uh, where we can help them uh, uh, watch what has happened during the pandemic and can't, 
pay closer, and we pay pretty close attention to trends and consumers and what they're buying, and then also making sure that uh, if they become a consistent, loyal uh, supporter of a product, that we keep that supply very consistent so they don't ever sway back away. Uh, I think that's it's really a key thing. Mark? Yeah, and I would say that we need to meet consumers where they are. And one of the places, I think, with dairy is good basic products. But if they're ready to be cooking and, and using food products at home, um, we need to be sure to teach them how to get out of that five-recipe rut and think about more ways to use these products um, so that they remain interested in them. Um, and uh, that's something we can do. I mean, we've certainly done it with pizza makers. We've shown them different places to put cheese on a pizza. Well, you know, let's use it in different recipes at home. I am really appreciative to have Anne Marie and Mike join us as special guests on this program. As Mark, uh, we always appreciate your good advice and counsel as we develop these programs. I'd like to thank everyone for watching Dairy Livestream today and have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.